Um, today, uh, I am here to introduce uh, my dear professor uh, Vinay Kumar Kapoor, sir, uh, uh, who will be moderating the session on uh, radical polycystectomy, uh, which is almost akin to uh, introducing uh, Sachin Ramesh Tendulkar to a cricketing fraternity. Uh, I am too small to uh, talk about uh, sir in detail. Sir, kindly pardon me if I'm making any mistakes. Um, Kapoor sir, uh, I have known Kapoor sir since uh, for four mm -hmm. years uh, so when I was in uh, SGPGI. Uh, his academic journey um, started uh, in All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, where he did his um, uh, MBBS and master's in surgery. Um, from there, for a brief period, for around uh, four or five years, sir, was in uh, All India Institute uh, working as an assistant professor. From there, from 1989 to 2021, uh, sir blessed Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, he was a professor of uh, our Department of Surgical Gastroenterology and Liver Transplant at Lucknow. Uh, we, uh, the MCH fellows, uh, the future fellows will really miss you, sir. Sir has retired and has now joined Mahatma Gandhi Medical College, uh, Jaipur, as a professor of surgical gastroenterology and liver transplant in 2021. Uh, sir, uh, during his uh, period in Sanjay Gandhi, in between, he was at uh, Royal College, Royal Hospital London in 1992, was, uh, had a brief stint in the liver transplant program at Hanover worked at uh, Cornwall Medical Center in New York, was at King's College uh, Hospital London for a year or more, uh, was in Malaysia for a brief period in 1999 and 2003. Uh, he was in USA again for a period of two, in 2008 and was uh, for a brief period in between was uh, working as a consultant in the Middle East in Abu Dhabi for around two years. Uh, his academic activities uh, needs no uh, further descriptions or elaborations. He is an examiner for the Master of Masters of Surgery uh, course, as well as the MCH course and various uh, MRCS courses across the globe. Uh, he is a principal investigator in a uh, basic gallbladder cancer research program, which is uh, done by the government of India. He is a co-investigator in an international research project of Japan. Uh, he's a Mary, he's a site principal investigator for various uh, multi-center uh, drug trials also. More than 200 plus publications, uh, chapters uh, in various uh, books. Uh, it needs no more elaboration known to everyone. His uh, famous works include uh, uh, works on uh, gallbladder cancer and bile duct injury, which is considered a uh, cult classic even now by MCH fellows. Uh, his international activities was an invited speaker to most of the international uh, forums, invited lectures at institutions across the globe, has many international uh, uh, publications in many international journals and journals and a guest uh, editor to many international journals. And uh, his academic activities needs no more description. My personal experience at uh, SGPJ has helped me to know Kapoor sir personally. Mm, his uh, admiration and love for Mahatma Gandhi is uh, known to all and his lifestyle uh, is almost the same. So he is a very keen listener, a very, uh, not a very loud person. So he leads a very simple lifestyle and is very punctual to the core, be it early morning academics, be it for ward rounds, uh, be it attending phone calls late at night, uh, being in the OT, uh, Sir has been a um, role model for all of us. Uh, sir's ability to capture small clinical moments. Sir always uh, takes uh, pictures of uh, interesting CT findings uh, and the small barium meal X-ray findings. Keeps a note of everything he uh, finds new in a small piece of paper in his pocket and then uh, always uh, comes back to us the next day and shares his uh, whatever he's read the next morning rounds i uh, we were all we all we all miss those and it's uh, it all sim uh, seems so simple but uh, it's uh, not very easy to carry out in routine life and uh, i'm sorry to say sir i'm not uh, uh, very uh, i've been not a very good 
student after I've passed MCH, sir. Uh, over to you, Kapoor, sir. Uh, I thank Baiju, sir, again for giving me this opportunity to introduce, sir. Uh, Kapoor, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abhishek Rajan, for the kind introduction, nice introduction of uh, Dr. Bikya Kapoor. We have almost 333 participants in the Zoom meeting itself. Now I invite Dr. Hari Govind to, uh, to present uh, uh, our speaker, Dr. Anir Akrabal. I welcome for the speaker and moderator to this show. Dr. Harikon, go ahead, please. Dr. Sunil Gaikwad, please hide your video. Sir, thank you, sir. Uh, sir am I audible, sir? Yeah. Thank yeah. You, sir? yeah. Uh, good day, all. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Baiju Senadevan, sir, for giving me this wonderful opportunity of introducing uh, the speaker. Uh, in such a massive uh, gastrointestinal surgery online platform. I am uh, really, I am e extremely privileged uh, and happy today to introduce my own professor and mentor uh, at uh, GB Pant Institute, um, New Delhi, Professor Anil Kumar Agarwal. Sir, uh, pardon me uh, for my shortcomings, if any uh, are there in my uh, introduct introductory uh, episode. Uh, so his fruitful uh, medical career started from uh, Maulana Asad Medical College, New Delhi. He did his post-graduation in general surgery from Safdarjang Hospital, New Delhi. He completed his uh, MCH in gastrointestinal surgery from uh, the very uh, GB Pant uh, Hospital, uh, New Delhi in 1995. Since then, he is associated with Maulana Asad Medical College and uh, GB Pant Hospital uh, institutions and associated institutions. The time uh, given to me would not be sufficient enough to enumerate all his achievements. Uh, I would just uh, mention uh, his, uh, some, some of his major achievements. So has a pursued fellowship in HPB and liver transplantation in Royal Free Hospital, London. He, has, uh, he was conferred uh, honorary uh, FRCS uh, from Royal College of Surgeons, England in uh, 2014. He was awarded Dr. B.C. Roy Award for eminent medical teacher in 2019. And he is currently the director, professor, head of department of gastrointestinal surgery at GB Pant Institute of Medical Education and he is uh, author of uh, many chapters in different reference uh, textbooks, including uh, Blumgard's uh, Surgery of the Liver, uh, Biliary Tract, and Pancreas. Uh, he has a very unique interest in the management of uh, gallbladder and pancreatic malignancies. He is a pioneer and expert in many advanced gallbladder cancers uh, surgeries, including uh, multivisceral uh, organ resection uh, and laparoscopic radical cholecystectomy. Many of his uh, landmark publications were related to gallbladder cancer surgeries. And uh, welcome you, sir, on behalf of uh, Senadivan Education Foundation. Uh, thank you, Baiju, sir, uh, once more for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Over to uh, sir. Thank you, Dr. Hari Govind, for the wonderful presentation of the uh, speaker, Dr. Anil Agarwal. Uh, he is a friend of mine. I know him for the last 10 years in various, uh, we meet in various yeah, SPBA meetings. Uh, I invite uh, Dr. Uh, B.K. Kapoor, uh, Professor, uh, uh, previous Professor SGBJ, to conduct the proceedings by inviting uh, our speaker. Or to B.K. Kapoor, sir. Thank you, Dr. Beju, for giving me this opportunity to be a part of uh, this very popular uh, online uh, CME program. Thank you, Abhishek, for your uh, kind words. I didn't know that you people noticed everything that I did. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, it is really an honor uh, for me to moderate this uh, lecture uh, by none other than Dr. Uh, Anil Agrawal, who's been a colleague and a very good friend for uh, more than three decades now. And uh, as most of you know, he's a global authority on uh, gallbladder cancer. Uh, I don't think anybody in Japan, Korea, even US uh, would talk about gallbladder cancer without mentioning his name. So it's really a pleasure and honor for me to moderate this session. Um, I would now request Dr. Anil Agrawal to please uh, start his uh, lecture. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you very much, Dr. Beju, for giving this opportunity on this uh, you know, very important platform that you have created. And I think the Sanadipan uh, Education Foundation that you have, I think it's become so popular and I'm very happy to see that the amount of people who log on to this. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hari, for your kind words. I mean, uh, I'm known to be pulling up our residents when they are with us, but I feel so happy when I see them doing so well all across the country. So thank you very much. And Dr. Vinay, thank you very much for your kind words, because I think your life is totally dedicated to gallbladder cancer. And I think we, we have learned so much from you. I think I, uh, I mean, I started my innings as a postgraduate and then in MCH and we used to look up to you and we, that has continued. And I think we have learned so much from you. So thank you very much. And I think even though, uh, Partly the philosophy of mine may be a little different from Dr. Vinay Kapoor, but that is what I think we have always been discussing that, you know, that that is fine for science. I think that is okay, as long as we have a reasonable justification to do one or the other thing. So I think, thank you very much once again, and I'll start my presentation. And my brief today is to talk about radical cholecystectomy and now you have 360 participants uh, listening to you. All right, thank you very much. So radical cholecystectomy, and I think I'll just take you an overview that what I'll take you through during my uh, next half an hour or so, I think 40 minutes is what has been allotted to me. So radical cholecystectomy, meaning an indication, and then selecting patients suitable for surgery, because I think we know that radical cholecystectomy is for gallbladder cancer. So we need to select the patients that those which are not going to be held by radical cholecystectomy and those which are going to be held. So you would need a good accurate staging and rule out distant metastasis. And as I would come to in a short while, rule out also distant lymph node disease because now interauto cable or the left of celiac lymph nodes are also uh, distant metastatic disease. So avoiding non-therapeutic laparotomy in that regard because all imaging is not able to pick up some of the surface liver mets and peritoneal mets. And so the staging laparoscopy and what we started doing that interior cable lymph node also can be assessed by the uh, lap laparoscopy. So radical cholecystectomy, and then we, I would discuss the major part of the talk would be the extent and technique of doing a radical cholecystectomy for limited disease and for local regionally advanced disease. And in that regard, I would also call upon, uh, talk about a little bit about the various approaches in terms of open laparoscopic and robotic. Now, if you look at, um, I mean, uh, the definition of uh, radical, and I, I, I mean, I, though we use the word radical, but I've used, uh, I've put this as extended also because I do not to upset, uh, our moderator, Dr. Vinay, because I know he's very fond of uh, using this uh, extended cholecystectomy. And in the literature, these are interchangeably used terminologies. And so basically it talks about that because a cholecystectomy alone would not be adequate treatment for gallbladder cancer. So you need a little beyond that. And beyond that would mean extended cholecystectomy or for that matter, why, why we think radical is because in addition to more removing the part of the adjacent liver, you also need to remove the lymph nodes which are draining that area. So I think, but in literature, both are interchangeably used. And I think in the literature, they talk about at the minimum, it includes removing the gallbladder with part of the liver and lymph nodes. 
And I would discuss again later that whether uh, what is the status of bile duct as part of the no standard radical cholecystectomy. And in addition, depending on what is the extent of the disease, you would do uh, more adjacent visceral resection. So, sorry, it's not moving. I think this. Right, so, so this is just again summing up the same that gallbladder with lymph nodes and the adjacent viscera would be resected. So I think we know that gallbladder cancer come in these different uh, varieties in the sense that uh, it may be that a cholecystectomy has been done thinking that it's a benign disease and subsequently it turns out to be a histological surprise and which is incidental gallbladder cancer or gallbladder cancer limited to gallbladder which most of the time if there's no distant metastasis would be resectable tumor and local regionally advanced tumor, you would have to assess that whether it is resectable per primum or would you need to do a downstaging of that using neoadjuvant and multimodality treatment. So I think the basic idea of all the investigation is staging the disease accurately and ruling out metastatic disease so that you do not end up either resecting something which would not be useful for the patient and add to the morbidity or, or doing a non-therapeutic laparotomy. So in that regard, accurate staging, proper patient selection, surgical planning, in which it will be identifying patients who would or would not benefit from surgery. And in this regard, the important things are detecting metastatic disease in which like the ultrasound, CT, MRI, and PET, interotor cable, lymph node, that is 16B1 is considered metastatic, which I'll again talk about, and local regionally advanced disease in which we need to see whether it is resectable and need for downstaging. And as I said, Avoiding non-therapeutic laparotomy because now it is a standard practice to do a staging laparoscopy in all these patients before you take up a patient for radical cholecystectomy. And again, it, as part of the staging laparoscopy, you can also sample into your tokeva lymph node. Uh, I don't know why it sometimes doesn't move. Uh, just, I thought I'd start with this because periotic lymph node Earlier on in the series in Japanese literature, they were doing extensive lymphadenectomy, including interotor cable. And this Professor Kondo and Nimura's paper uh, put it in perspective that extensive resection in the presence of uh, interotor cable lymph node doesn't add to the survival advantage. I'm not going into the controversy of it because in some selected patient, there may still be a case, but by and large, for all the postgraduates, I think it would be that it is fair to say that the world literature talks about that if periotic lymph nodes are lymph involved, then it is, it is considered metastatic disease and it would not be worthwhile to do a resection. This is just talking about that this is the final station of the, this interotor cable lymph node and which is we want to. I'm talking about this even before going to the theater because initially we started doing, looking at it uh, during surgery as interotor cable lymph node biopsy. But subsequently we thought that why not we can sample them by endoscopic ultrasound means. This is the paper which we have published uh, in which we did a routine IAC lymph node sampling. At that time it was open surgery and 18.6% of patients were the ones, 34 out of 183 had positive. And so you didn't go ahead for a resection because if you had gone ahead for resection in these cases, then probably it may have added to the morbidity, but not so much to the survival. So that is why then what we started doing was endoscopic ultrasound. I had at that time discussion with Dr. Pramod Garg, and I think at our at institute, because at that time we did not have an US and he was kind enough to start doing it. And because he said, there's no literature. I said that the literature is existing in terms of saying interotic cable lymph node, if they are positive. So can you reach those? So they started doing that. And subsequently at our institution, Dr. A.S. Puri and Dr. Siddharth were helping us out. And one of the caveat in this would be that you have to make sure that you are not sampling a, a retro pancreatic lymph node because often it is uh, in a similar location, but you have to distinguish that it is between the furrow, between the uh, aorta and the cava. And so it should be interaorta cable lymph node. If that is positive, then you don't proceed, but if retropancreatic is positive, you can still go ahead and do a resection. So, uh, I mean, just to say that even despite good imaging now available, which has become far better than what it used to be, small surface liver metastasis, peritoneal deposits still miss with advanced imaging. And for these, that is why it is almost a standard practice in our and other centers across the world 
in which you do a diagnostic laparoscopy and in a conventional way, you have to find that there are no and if you were doing a conventional earlier, you would do a interotic cable lymph node sampling from that region. And now these are, this is a, a summary of some of the papers. There's a meta-analysis in which they talked about various uh, studies, which they have talked about. And in fact, initial uh, paper had come out from uh, Dr. Vinay Kapoor in this one, this 91 with uh, Shali Nagarwal as the first author. And in which they had, because at that time their yield was higher, probably because at that time the imaging was not as advanced as it is today. But when we analyzed our data of 409 primary gallbladder cancer patients, because interotic, uh, I mean, sorry, the uh, incidental gallbladder cancer, we excluded from this at the time of analysis, because in those, some of the times, because of adhesions, you may not be able to do a full assessment. So that is why we thought that, that even the literature also that exists. And subsequently, what we realized in this, we had divided into what METs would be seen as soon as you put in a scope versus when you needed a more extensive uh, dissection. So in that, what we found was our in initial analysis that a few of the METs in the liver, which should have been picked up by laparoscopy, were not picked up. And that was because they were in the hidden areas. So that is why subsequent to that, before you convert into open, you must put in another scope, probably in the line of the incision and make sure that there is no other, uh, uh, I mean, metastasis in the hidden areas. And if there is also do a biopsy, because in our country, in fact, we uh, published one paper in which we talk about that even some of the interauto cable turn out to be tubercular. So I think the final proof is once you have done a histopathology, of that. So just, just trying to say that two port laparoscopy to assess hidden areas, obtain biopsy for metastasis for histopathology. And this is the group from where lymph node or tissue is taken out. That's the left renal vein and that's the kappa and the aorta. So that can also be assessed by laparoscopic means. So now coming to what is done in radical cholecystectomy. Let us see that first, what is a standard radical cholecystectomy for gallbladder cancer, which is limited to the gallbladder, and for those which is beyond the gallbladder, meaning it is involving the adjacent viscera or vessels. So I think in the first go, we'll look at the adequate resection for early gallbladder cancer or gallbladder cancer limited to GB, which more often would be up to T2 and sometimes T3, and more locally regionally advanced would be aggressive resection we'll talk about. So as I initial slides also, I showed you that Standard radical cholecystectomy talks about liver resection, which may be from a wedge to a segment 4B5 or lymph node dissection. Sorry, just. Yeah, so I think there is a debate about wedge resection versus segment 4B5 and wedges two to three centimeter of wedge close to the gallbladder bed would be removed and segment 4B5 would be the anatomical segment 4B5. And the anatomical basis for this segment 4B5 came from the study from Japan in which they talked about that uh, because the cystic veins drain into the segment 4B and 5, 2 to 20. And so it was thought that it may lead to micrometastasis in that area. So it would be worthwhile to take out a segment 4B and 5 together with the gallbladder, a gallbladder rather than doing just a two centimeter wedge. And this is just to allude to that uh, the bottom line was that it should be an R0 resection. The Japanese literature su supported that uh, both are equal in terms of oncological outcome. And I think I'll just take you a few steps to the critical uh, about how to do a segment 4B5, just the technical aspect. And one of the challenge would be segment 4B. Usually it is the, uh, uh, once you take the pedicle uh, in the fissure and you can, uh, I mean, clamp the segment 4B, and ligate it or clip it, and you will have the demarcation on segment 4B. The only thing is you have to realize that sometimes there may be some anatomical variations. And so you must make sure by trial clamping before you ligate that you have not also taken a segment 4A branch because sometimes it may have a common this thing. And identification transaction line between segment five and six. So I think this is demarcation boundary once you take it in the fissure is in this, the segment 4B would be devascularized. And 
the way to find between segment five and six would be either you can do a temporary clamping of the posterior or anterior particle by the positive or the negative uh, highlighting in terms of ischemia. So you can demarcate between the segment five and six and where you bring the horizontal line from the segment 4B would determine that how much you want to resect 4B and 5. We don't use that injection of dye. Some of the Japanese literature do talk about injecting the dye and uh, segment 5 uh, delineation. Or what we often do, and more so in laparoscopy also, is that we ligate the segment 5 branch after that is just below and behind the middle vein as you extend the dissection from 4B towards 5. And you can use an intraoperative ultrasound to demarcate the, to mark out the, not demarcate, mark out the right hepatic vein and extrapolate it onto the surface. That would give you an idea between segment five and six, or you can use the surface landmarks, surface marking. So demarcation boundary between segment five and eight can be because if you clamp the posterior, then this will become ischemic and you will have the demarcation between five and six, or if you did the anterior, most more often it's the posterior that you clamp but you can do that interior also. Or even we realize that with the surface marking and intraoperative ultrasound, it's almost the same. So then you extend this, so 4B5, and this uh, uh, Kale uh, had helped us, and we had written this chapter in, uh, in the Professor Yuman Fong and Professor uh, uh, Miyazaki's book, and this is just trying to show that with the surface, uh, with the intraoperative ultrasound, actually we had marked, and with the surface marking also, that's the right hepatic vein. And this is the tributary of the right hepatic vein, which during dissection we found there. So segment 4B5, so this is almost going horizontally from there. And this is between segment five and six. So this is, this is actually in our initial experience, we had mobilized this liver quite a bit, and this is lying onto the abdominal wall. And you can see the 4B, has already been demarcated and segment five we did it with the marking with the intraoperative ultrasound. So that is as far as the segment 4B is concerned. And then what about the lymph node? I mean, thoroughly, I think it will be better visible that all these lymph nodes in the hepatoduodenal ligament along the hepatic artery and to the right of celiac, because even though celiac is considered as metastatic, but to the right, it may it is difficult to ascertain whether you are dealing with a hepatic artery lymph node or is it a celiac? So I think most of the literature and most of the surgeons would take what is to the left of celiac as metastatic, whereas to the right is all cleared. The debate is about retropancreatic lymph node, which AJCC had talked about putting them in the advanced disease. However, if you look at the Japanese literature, they have talked about reasonably good survival with including retropancreatic lymph node being positive. So we, similar to several centers across the world, would also remove retropancreatic lymph node together with this. So this is just pictorially again talking about, this is the region A, which is what was talked about earlier, that is excluding pancreatic head, but we would do A and B as most of the centers, and the C, which is the celiac or the superior mesenteric would be metastatic disease. So I think this is just talking about interautocable lymph node, you sample, retropancreatic you will need to include in the resection, and of course you'll clear hepatoduodenal ligament along the hepatic artery, till the, uh, uh, I mean the celiac. So just trying to show you pictorially, because even though as surgeons, we get more thrilled when we do liver resection, but if you can take out the lymph node entire thing as a chain, it is no less thrilling. Although of course it is not essential that you bring it out as in one piece, as long as you've done a complete clearance. And so the, that brings to the bile duct excision. Uh, Professor Miyazaki in his paper had talked about and several other authors have talked about that whether it should include bile duct excision as part of a radical cholecystectomy, especially T2 and beyond. So just wanted to look at that whether bile duct excision should be part of it. But there are several studies in the literature that even though, as Professor Miyazaki said, that it may lead to better neural clearance, but that has not translated into survival advantage because we are not sure whether the hilum is the only level at which you would do a complete clearance, so to say, of those nerves and other tissue. So as of now, we, similar to several other centers, reserve a bile duct excision only for situation like this one, you can see lower down as a papillary tumor or direct involvement with the neck of the tumor as in the upper picture or the positive duct, duct margin or extensive hepatoduodenal lymph lymphopathy in which it is difficult to say, uh, clear 
without excising the bile duct or in post-operative cases in which it is difficult to ascertain which is whether it is fibrosis or tumor and or if it is a cholidocal cyst as in this case as you can see that this is a cholidocal cyst as well as a gallbladder cancer mass so i think having said that for limited gallbladder cancer you can do a what is a radical cholecystectomy which is liver resection and the lymphadenectomy which i just uh, talked about now let us look at the same thing can be done by laparoscopic means minimal invasive and initially the concerns were is it feasible yes it is feasible then if it is feasible should it be done and the one of the important thing was that one was that can it be done with the same radicality which was better proven because as the experience of the world uh, i mean several centers uh, uh, improved in terms of minimal invasive approach and the main thing which was there was the risk of port site metastasis because the earlier there were fears that laparoscopic approach lead to early spread or recurrence and whether it was a myth or reality and actually uh, i'm not going into the details of that but i think we also looked at because actually if you are talking about metastasis in an incidental gallbladder in a uh, cholecystectomy specimen in which one did not suspect gallbladder cancer you had held the gallbladder from wherever you wanted there might have been a spillage so it is not fair to extrapolate that recurrence because of gallbladder cancer because in radical cholecystectomy when you do you actually remove it you never kind of handle the gallbladder tumor area and you make sure that bile spillage is not there and let us look at does it compromise on the long term results so these were the early feasibility studies but i think the uh, these two uh, papers i have highlighted which talked about that there was no port site recurrence over a period of nearly 2 years or more and you would agree that if port site recurrence was to occur it would be an earlier event and most of them would occur within a few months to a year and this is the important paper professor han who is a very good friend and in fact i owe this that once we looked at this paper and their experience i started doing at our center in 2011 and this paper very convincingly showed because what they did was that in 36 patient with suspected gallbladder cancer they did a wedge resection of the liver together with the gallbladder and sent it for frozen in half the patient it turned out to be benign so that nothing else was required in the remaining they went ahead and did a lymphadenectomy and they found that over 27 months follow up there was no port site recurrence so i think uh, the like this is a picture showing a segment 4b5 resection laparoscopically so you have to do the same thing laparoscopic so you can do that this and you can have a good lymphadenectomy bearing all the vessels and you can see that that the left and the right artery these are uh, these two pictures are one patient these are different patients in which you can do a complete clearance of the hepatodiurnal ligament along the hepatic artery till the celiac axis and you can see we actually go up to the fork of the towards the aorta of the left gastric and celiac so i think this led to a consensus statement and in fact in this consensus meeting that professor han had held in 2016 I, i think almost every center which had done more than 10 cases by that time were there in that meeting and they talked about the, sir. sorry recording on am i audible yeah hello yeah okay so and then we are very happy to see that after this 2016 meeting there are several papers with now 50 and more patients which have talked about good experience of laparoscopic radical cholecystectomy and in fact from our own uh, country uh, dr mahesh goel from uh, tata memorial and the group they have talked about robotic radical cholecystectomy and i think uh, people are not happy and there are a lot of a lot of reports with more than 50 patient in fact a meta analysis of even uh, 200 plus cases and of course once the comparable results are there the some of the advantages are obvious looking at the you know uh, not just the disfigurement but also if you look at uh, yeah so i think early return to work and early institution of adjuvant treatment and this is a picture that i wanted to show in this because this was just a day before my talk in the asi delhi chapter meeting and in fact uh, i said let's take a picture of this patient and i was quite glad to see that our residents took a picture of this lady standing 
by the bedside, an obese patient with a BMI of 38.5 with an open radical cholecystectomy, I would doubt that if we can make her, she would be so comfortable and still smiling, giving that picture and not being forced by us. So I think some of these advantages are obvious. And this is, and in, in fact, even in terms of long term, though one cuckoo doesn't a summer it makes, but this is our uh, initial patients, which is now nearing 10 years. And he's, uh, he came for follow up just a few months ago. And he was 21 years then. And though, of course, this lymph nodes were negative in this. this uh, and the same thing can be done robotic. This is our first case of robotic radical polycystectomy. We have done five till uh, thus far. And just to take you through a little bit of our experience of laparoscopic radical polycystectomy, which we just presented, Dr. Vidya, our resident, and Dr. Naveen, they had to compile this data together and put up in the uh, ILLS conference, which is going on yesterday and today. And in this, they analyzed 179 patients. And in these, uh, out of these, six were converted and 13 patients were benign. So uh, 160 were the one in which radical cholecystectomy was done with reasonably good results. And in terms of, uh, I mean, the blood loss, operative time, and the morbidity mortality, and uh, three year and five year survival of 70.2 and 56.3. And port side recurrence was not there in any of these patients because of this. And this is a tabular form, various studies. And this is the study that I was talking about from almost right. 235 patients. And so it is very nice to see that in several countries, several centers, now they are resorting to. A minimal access approach and probably okay. laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomy was initial of the uh, procedures which was started and probably for gallbladder cancer now uh, is the uh, kind of final procedure in terms of GI surgery. So just now taking you through that is the radical cholecystectomy because radical cholecystectomy depends on the stage of the disease. So what we Till now have discussed about is when the gallbladder cancer is limited to the gallbladder and you can do away, uh, I mean, resect that with liver resection and lymphadenectomy plus minus in some of the case, cases with bile duct resection. But when there's extensive involvement of either liver or adjacent viscera or neck tumor leading to biliary obstruction or vascular involvement, let's see one by one. This is one of the patient, but this patient, even though this is involving liver, but it is more exophytic. And uh, so still probably may not always need a extensive resection in terms of extended right hepatectomy. This is just taking you through the AJCC staging that the T3 and T4 tumors, which would be more for adjacent viscera involvement and the uh, invading the major vessels. And liver resection, wedge and segment 4B5 we talked about, but when there's more extensive involvement, like this one, you can see in the down picture, you would need an extended dissection for extensive tumor or vascular involvement or adequate hilar clearance when there's a bile duct involvement. But however, in some patients in which it is because of the hilar involvement or especially so in the neck tumors, if for oncological reasons, you do not need to sacrifice segment 4A, then you can do a modified extended right hepatectomy, including segment 4B, sparing segment 4A, so that that will give you that extra liver tissue and reduce the risk of liver failure. Just, uh, just pictorially again showing you that. And this is what I meant by saying that 4A can be preserved. And more so in the jaundiced patient, this extra liver tissue may be akin to doing a portal vein embolization or now coming to adjacent viscera involvement, that is the duodenum colon, or it could be the gastroduodenum colon or the pancreas. Now, when there is minimal involvement and sometimes you're not sure whether it is tumor or, uh, I mean, just uh, infiltrate, uh, I mean, it is stuck there so grossly that you don't want to breach the planes, then you can do either a limited resection that when there's small area of contact without leading to limited compromise, duodenal steam resection, and when there is wide area, but no pancreatic involvement, distal gastrectomy with proximal duodectomy. Earlier in our paper, we had talked about distal gastrectomy with D1 resection, but we realized that in some of the ones, we needed to actually do a, a go up to the D2, that is supra papillary. So we labeled it as distal gastrectomy with proximal duodenectomy. This is just showing with the stapler, you can do that minimal. And when you needed more extensive, you can do proximal duodenectomy. And sorry, D1 
these are some of the papers uh, that we published in which we looked at prospectively as well as our retrospective experience. And we realized that with urinal infiltration, it is still resectable and there it leads to a meaningful survival. And so it should be done. And in fact, I need to do a HPD in all these patients. So when colonic involvement, again, you can do a, a colonic sleeve resection or you can do a health hemicolectomy if more extensive involvement. And one has to also realize that all of these patients, like this is transmural involvement, but all of these patients may not have a transmural involvement. This is one of the patient in which it is both involvement of the uh, duodenum as well as the colon, and you can still receive an R0 resection. And in fact, in this, surprisingly, the bile duct was fine because as you can see that most of these tumor which are involving the adjacent viscera happen to be in the body or the fundus of the, uh, of the gallbladder. Now this is in which it is also involved the diaphragm and the duodenum resection. This is an interesting patient recently we did and in a couple of patients recently, a part of the rib also had to be excised. This is one of such cases in which presented with a cholecystocutaneous fistula. And in fact, a lot of time those are benign, but this was a malignant <laughs> Sorry, is somebody not liking my presentation, looks like. Okay. So, I muted. Please go ahead. I yeah. muted. So, so this patient, in, in fact, you can see that part of the rib also has been excised and uh, with the cutaneous, uh, this through and through. So this needed an extensive resection, but it is still worthwhile doing that. Now coming to the pancreas involvement, in fact, earlier on, uh, the one was a bit little more liberal with doing an HPD. And in fact, Professor uh, Nagino, in fact, also analyzed their experience of HPD in cholangiocarcinoma versus gallbladder cancer. And they realized that the results were not so good of HPD in gallbladder cancer. And though there's a spectrum of uh, uh, hepatopancreatic duodenectomy from a cholestatic liver needing a liver extensive liver resection and PD versus PD and segment 4B5 resection. But anyway, what they analyzed was that if you did a upper outer, which is the area more commonly involved, wedge resection, the results were comparable. So I think similar to this group and a lot of other groups, we would restrict an HPD for direct infiltration of pancreas by tumor, which is more extensive than an upper outer little bit involvement, or there are bulky retropancreatic lymph node, which cannot be cleared without resecting pancreatic head. But having said that more often than not, or most often, you can do a lymph nodal clearance from that region, even without resorting to a PD. Just to take you through a little bit of brief experience that we had published about uh, when we analyzed 327 patients over a six, seven year period. And out of these, we looked at extra hepatic adjacent organs. Single extra hepatic organ was in 49 and two or more in 64 patients. And this is just telling you that on the same philosophy that sleeve resection versus gastri uh, distal gastrectomy, proximal duodenectomy, and similarly for colon and pancreatic involvement and bile duct involvement, this excision was done. And we realized that in our series, the resectability rate at that time was 57.5%. But we tried to analyze that if we had not done any adjacent viscera resection, that would have dropped to 37.6. And if we had not done beyond a single organ involvement, it would have been 46.2. And not all of them were mural involvement. And uh, so this is the histopathological analysis and N0, N1. And when we analyzed, we realized that those patients in which were node negative, the survival was similar to what you had without adjacent viscera involvement, though there was a difference. And I think it dropped down when there was lymph node and involvement with two or more adjacent viscera involvement. So the resectability improved to 57.4% with this, median survival less significant less in group A compared to group B. And however, there was no significant difference in median survival of node negative GBC patients between two groups. And among node positive patients, median survival, I just said that, yeah. So the same thing that adjacent viscera we are talking about, now for the last some time, we have started doing that also laparoscopic. And I think uh, one of our uh, faculty colleague, Amit Javed was with us and we, we were trying to push this together, a few of these things. So duodenum, this has been resected, distal CBD resection and the colonic resection. The same thing that you can do open can also be done laparoscopic. And now coming to the biliary obstruction, I'll just uh, talk about it later because we did it in 11 cases, adjacent viscera resection laparoscopically. 
uh, just to talk about with biliary obstruction. Now, even though there were some studies initially which were talking about uh, that probably it may not be worthwhile to do a, a liver resection or a radical cholecystectomy in those with jaundice. However, that was data that was not based on a very robust data. And in fact, when you looked at the Japanese literature, like in this uh, significant series from Kondo group, though they did not differentiate between jaundice and non-jaundice in terms of the, to begin with, but they talked about 116 patients, 80 resected, and 70 of these had SOG, which means any which way that you look at it, there were a significant percentage of patients which were resected in the jaundice group, and three and five year overall survival were this uh, percentage. Seven with SOG survived more than three years, of these four survived more than five years. Even though you could argue the numbers, but actually if you see that in gallbladder cancer with jaundice, you, uh, the average lifespan is supposed to be in a few months, not so much in years. So I think if your bottom line is within a reasonable morbidity, mor mortality, you can do it, then the survival would be advantageous. This is our paper, which at that time we analyzed 14 patients in 2007, trying to look at that whether any of these survive more than two years and we had reasonably good results and so we, published it in Annals of Surgical Oncology, which was biliary obstruction and gallbladder cancer is not sine qua non of inoperability and all patients should be evaluated and looked for resectability. Now, subsequently, this is the paper with the much larger series from Japan, which has almost settled the issue that gallbladder cancer involving extrahepatic bile duct is worthy of resection. And they had 100 patients with T3, T4 disease and 73 had extra hepatic bile duct involvement and they said formal right hepatectomy performed a majority. This is a little different from what we have published and what our, the French group uh, has also talked about that we would still go ahead and do a parenchyma preserving resection in many of these patients. And while five year survival and median survival was worse in their series, but they've written 12 patients survived beyond five years despite the presence of bile duct involvement. And these are some of the other series from different centers. And you can see that some of the series have talked about reasonable, as you can see that in most of the series, the morbidity mortality has been reasonable. And in our series also, we lost one patient out of 14 of these. And uh, the longest survival in this category for us was 12 years. And so it is worthwhile to do resection in these patients. And in, in that analysis that I showed you a little while earlier, and two, three, and five year overall survival at that time was 85, 27, and 9%. Though, of course, it throws different kinds of challenges in terms of gallbladder cancer with jaundice because liver failure is an issue. And in fact, the Kondo and Nemura group talked about doing a portal vein embolization in a lot of their patients because they were resorting to, in most of the cases, extended right hepatectomy. But preoperative bilirubin drainage is done, and in some of the patients, portal vein embolization, and you have to distinguish it between whether the common confluence is there or the confluence is not formed and is receding up into the hilum. Because this is just trying to show pictorially that in these patients, you can come with the resection from both sides and come onto that hilar region. And in fact, you can see the PTBD in the right duct and this is the left duct and this is the artery which, has, which could be saved in this. So parenchyma preserving resection can be done and with reasonable, and you can see that this is one of the patient. This is actually the sectoral anterior posterior and this side is the left duct. And this patient, you can see that there is a reasonable margin above the, uh, the tumor area in that region. Because I think this gallbladder cancer, neck obstruction is different from a high local angiocarcinoma. This is our longest survival, though in this case, we did an extended right hepatectomy. Uh, this, and when there is more, I mean, when you needed to do an extended right hepatectomy, you would preserve, as I already alluded to, that you can preserve the segment 4A. So I think you can modify that to preserve as much as liver as you want. And also another thing which uh, uh, we presented at a IHPBA meeting that if right hepatic artery is involved, and but the portal vein is all right, you could get away by doing a segment 4B5 resection without needing to resort to uh, extended resection. This was a matter of discussion yesterday in the ILLS meeting. We did not put up our data, but I think I'll just come to in a little while. So this right posterior duct 
I mean, this is labeled as that. And this is the left side. And this is the one of the cases that we recently did of gallbladder cancer with hyla block laparoscopically. So I think this area we have not yet been venturing into, but we have recently started doing. Right. So vascular involvement is the next set in which there will right hepatic artery. As I said, the right hepatic artery alone would not merit an extended resection. Right hepatic artery and right portal involvement, then obviously you need to do an extended right hepatectomy because segment 4B you have to include in the resection. So minimal, it has to be right hepatectomy with segment uh, 4B. And main portal involvement, you can do a main to the left hep hepatic uh, portal vein because most of the time it is in the neck tumor, so right would be gone. And common hepatic artery involvement and main portal involvement, we would, as of now, consider this as a contraindication, but I am aware that in some of the Japanese literature, I think Professor Miyazaki has published some of the papers with long-term survival in such patients. So this is just taking you through that when right hepatic artery is involved, and sometimes you can get a proximal and distal vessel to anastomose, but that may not always be the case when it is receding a little more internally, and because of the vessel size, you may not get a vessel distally to anastomose. And in that, if there is a backflow, what we realized that that would be a, maybe a, even more safer, though even otherwise you could ligate that. And this is a paper we presented in the IHPBA Korea. But subsequent to this, when we analyzed, I think Dr. Kalai and Dr. Prithvi had analyzed 25 patients, we did a right hepatic artery uh, ligation. And out of those, we had four patients had leak of which one needed a PCD, but the other patient, one other morbidity was unrelated to the uh, hepatic artery involvement. So this I've just, I'll skip this because I talked about right hepatic artery and right portal vein involvement. This is this one such case in which the artery and the vein both are involved and the left is all right. So you can do an extended right hepatectomy preserving segment for uh, A. Right, this I've already talked about. And I think I talked about a little bit of our experience, but I think when you look at the Japanese literature, because I put this, table because this talks about T-related and N-related because the AJCC classification has gone back and forth. This is a 2009 paper, but you can see that even up to T4 at that time, 14.1% was five-year survival. And even in lymph node, even though the negative has much better outcome at 60.3, but you can see that even when there is more extensive lymph node involvement, there is meaningful survival and three years results are pretty good. And some of them have survived beyond five years. So just uh, for incidental gallbladder cancer, the same thing is called a completion radical cholecystectomy. I'm not going into the details of that, except to say that in addition to this, even though there's some debate in the literature as of now, we excise all the ports because in our country, the routine practice is not to take out the gallbladder in a bag. And plus it's a small price to be paid because we have dealt with quite a few of the port side uh, uh, metastasis, which has come subsequently in the follow-up after open incidental gallbladder cancer. Uh, yeah, okay. So just to take you through just the last segment, that is the MIS for radical cholecystectomy for advanced gallbladder cancer when adjacent visceral is involved. I just already talked about that uh, our experience, we have done about 11 cases. This is Gums et al, Shirobi, Navarro had a few patients and this is our experience. So 11 patients that we have done with single organ, double organ or three organ resection. And I was very happy to see this paper from Kalai Rasan Raja, who's a faculty at JIPMER, Pondicherry, who talked about, I think the first reported in the world literature of laparoscopic hepatopancreatoduodenectomy for locally advanced gallbladder cancer. And in fact, he in this paper had also talked about ligating the hepatic artery, uh, right? and doing a segment 4B5 with pancreatoduodenectomy. So laparoscopic radical cholecystectomy is feasible with adequate early oncological outcome in early GBC and selected locally advanced GBC patients, which are comparable to open radical cholecystectomy, and it has the potential to be adopted in surgical management of gallbladder cancer, fear of early and port site recurrence notwithstanding. And for tumors needing adjacent visceral resection also, it can be done. So, Surgery is the mainstay of treatment and radical cholecystectomy is the procedure which is performed. 
Of course, it is important that you early detect the tumor, proper patient selection, limit morbidity, mortality associated with surgery, and achieve curative resection. And multimodality ther therapy can be taken help of because now we know that some amount of chemotherapy works. And in some of the borderline resectable, though that is not very well defined because it depends from center to center. But in those patients, if you thought that it was unresectable to begin with, you can probably downstage them and reassess. And again, just maybe a repetition of this, uh, the initial part of my talk, that accurate staging with, with the now improved imaging and bit, I mean, judicious use of PET scans, especially I said judicious use because in our country, the cost is also a factor. Proper patient selection, surgical planning, identifying patient which would not be helped even before deciding the extent of surgery, we have to see that which are the patients which would not be benefited by a distant metastatic disease, which, we, which would be detected only by good imaging or antibiotic of a lymph node, which can be taken the help of endoscopic ultrasound and local regionally advanced disease, how far you are ready to go in terms of vascular resection and or HPD and avoiding non-therapeutic laparotomy by staging laparoscoping and advanced extended laparoscopic staging. And there are certain things which have developed over the years by different groups that is emphasis on lymph nodal clearance and that it's not just the liver resection, which is important, it's more important to do a lymph nodal clearance and extent of surgical resection tailored to the disease that any involvement of duodenum or pancreas would not need an HPD. So you can do a limited gastroduodenal resection, preserving segment 4A in extended hepatectomy, improving FLR to reduce risk of liver failure in extended resection. And this also brings in addition to portal vein embolization ALPS, we had planned in two patients, but we haven't done ALPS in any of these patients for gallbladder cancer, resection for local or regionally advanced disease and improvement in perioperative care and the supportive adjuvant chemotherapy makes it worthwhile to resect these patients within a reasonable morbidity and mortality so that there is a place for aggressive resection and radical cholecystectomy has gone beyond just for limited gallbladder disease. And this all translate in, translates into reduced perioperative morbidity mortality and better overall survival. And the same thing is now being delivered by several centers by the minimal invasive approach for laparoscopic or robotic. Thank you very much for your attention. I, I hope I have not exceeded time, maybe five minutes here. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Anil Agarwal. Actually, uh, you have taken us through a a different journey. Actually, we are all excited to see the uh, pictures of this. And uh, we'll be uh, happy only if you can share some videos. Uh, and uh, probably VK, uh, uh, Professor Vika Kapoor sir also will be agreeing with me uh, that uh, Dr. Anir uh, I can share some videos. I'll just, I'll just, what I'll do is I had kept one sh video which I thought I'll show you. I mean, that segment or maybe. Uh, that segment 4B uh, clips had already, I just, I, maybe I'll just take that. This is just trying to take the segment 4B. We double, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's the segment 4B demarcated. And then I'm coming to that part in which Below and behind the middle vein, we'll find the segment five pedicle. I'll just show you once we trial clamp that. You can see the line of a demarcation there. So this is clipped and Sorry, this is a makeshift CUSA with the uh, 
outer tubing locally made okay it has got cartridge also is it sorry it no, this doesn't have the cartridge this doesn't have the cartridge okay in fact you know uh, about this thing cautery that is reminding me of the robotic when we did yeah i got a robotic uh, harmonic and i used it but then i realized that the cautery of the you know the shears in that uh, robotic is so good that segment 4b5 you don't really need a harmonic for the robotic uh, okay. okay coloration paper was uh, robotic is it yeah kalai was uh, no 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 the kalai this one was lab uh, hpd okay but i think uh, he was just telling me that in the silas conference yesterday probably he has presented a robotic radical polycystic me video so that's the yeah you can see that wonderful right Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anur Agarwal, uh, once again for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I now request uh, Professor Vikas Kapusa to take over the uh, proceedings, uh, uh, take the questions from the chat box, and discuss. Thank you, Dr. Anil, for a very detailed and exhaustive covering coverage of this topic. Uh, there are a few points which I have noted down myself uh, based on what students uh, usually ask. Uh, us and also there are some uh, questions and comments in the chat box which I have done. So I'll go one by one. Uh, I think few important points which you have uh, uh, mentioned uh, and emphasized uh, need to be emphasized again. One is the importance of the distant lymph nodes. So we all know distant metastases, but distant lymph nodes are also very very important and. Uh, you have always been saying that uh, this Yoto cable, the 16B1 group of lymph nodes is very important and every attempt must be made to target it preoperatively or at the time of staging laparoscopy or at the time of laparotomy and uh, their prognosis is bad. So that's very, very important point which everyone must note. Uh, so the first question is the role of PET scan in primary gallbladder cancer as well as in incidental gallbladder cancer. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, as uh, I think the last <laughs> webinar that you were moderating and we had this discussion because even though some centers more routinely use a PET scan, but we would sparingly use it in the sense that we would use it for advanced, local regionally advanced disease, or if there were some other indications to suggest that more than a standard radical cholecystectomy would be required, or some of the cases which throw up, like we had one patient after an incidental gallbladder cancer presented with a somewhat of a non-healing uh, wound. And then we got a PET scan done and in fact it threw a metastasis in several other sites. I mean, one could argue that you could relax your indications for doing a PET scan if it was locally available and the cost was not so much of an issue. But I think as of now, we would only sparingly use that because there have been some people who are talking about in various sites, but I think with the ultrasound, good use or endoscopic ultrasound, you can probably reduce the need for a PET scan. And I think uh, by and large, it has not been so useful to us. We are in the process of analyzing, but for the limited gallbladder cancer, it has not been of so much use. And I think another thing which is emerging is that in which I said that I'm not touching on that because it may become a controversial issue. But nowadays, in some of the patients, selected good risk patients with better image, a better uh, adjuvant treatment, you may, after uh, talking to the family, go ahead for resection, even in limited uh, ext uh, distant lymph nodes. Yeah, that's what uh, somebody had asked. So how, how do you select these cases who have distant nodes which are positive, but still you go ahead with resection. See, what, what I, I would, by and large, if I was to, you know, sum it up to say that something which is coming out with segment 4B5 and local regional lymphadenectomy, 
then I would go ahead because the morbidity mortality of that is very, very minuscule. So that is why, and because adjuvant treatment, whatever advantage we may gain, even if you know it doesn't translate into a very big advantage. But I think similar to when we talk about pancreatic cancer, in which we, they say that you know a small met elsewhere if your morbidity mortality is less than 5%. So I think a similar extrapolation can be in this category because I think double trouble we would not want that if somebody is needing a more extensive resection, like you would certainly not do an HPD or for that matter, uh, I mean, or a vascular resection in those patients which have interotic lymph node, which are positive and, and the, or the one category is the disease related. The second is the, also the patient related. If the patient is in a position to undergo, a, you know, within a reasonable morbidity mortality and this, we have changed a little bit philosophy after we started doing laparoscopic because even the morbidity of that is even lesser, we would think so. Probably if you did a laparoscopic radical cholecystectomy, then you could do that. But having said that, let me also say that in those cases, we have not yet done an extensive lymph nodal clearance of periotic and others. So there is a related question that do you use the tumor marker levels to indicate PET scan? Yes, we do as CA19-9, but that not always it is available to us and we would not uh, want the patient to pay if it is not done in hospital at times. And we would not base our decision of resecting or not resecting on that. However, as the literature suggests that if there is a CA19-9, which is high, it may be more prudent to get a PET scan done to make sure that you are not dealing with a metastatic disease as is true for other cancers and tumor markers. The other point which I would like to reiterate again is uh, which uh, Dr. Agrawal has probably the world's largest experience is on the use of uh, staging laparoscopy and both his group as well as our group very strongly recommend and use it uh, in all patients uh, with gallbladder cancer before we go ahead with a laparotomy for resection. There is a, a question uh, somebody wants to know that in what percentage approximately of your cases uh, you you have to do a, or you do a CBD resection as a part of radical cholecystectomy without uh, jaundice, without jaundice, without CBD involvement? See, without neck tumor or without jaundice, there have been very few. Like there have been an occasional patient which probably came back in early of the neck tumor and which has not yet led to jaundice. And so even though it is reaching up to the cystic duct, but CBD has not been kind of encroached. So, but, so in those cases, you would still go ahead and do a resection because you, know, you won't get a good margin there. So some of those cases, but apart from that, by and large, most of the cases have been either because of neck tumor leading to jaundice or because of some associated pathology like cholidocal cyst. <laughs> Or, or as I have already put it in that list, when cystic duct margin was positive or when there was a papillary tumor, the papillary tumor, again, we are a bit selective at the moment because you, even though people, uh, literature talks about 8% uh, kind of uh, multi this thing and in the uh, pile duct, but it is not yet clearly proven. Although you did mention about port site resection, but would you like to talk again about your view on port site metastasis and port site resection? during the re-operation? Uh, actually, you know, because there are quite a few fallacies in the, uh, in the people basing this idea about uh, port site resection not helping based on the MSKCC paper, which is actually a retrospective analysis and not in all patients they have done a port site excision. And it is more of a statistical thing. And because in US, I think I, when I talked to Dr. Professor Jarnagin, I think by and large, their practice is to take out the gallbladder in a bag, which is not the practice in our scenario. So, and also because we are more like an endemic region. And because we have seen quite a few patients coming with port site recurrence after incidental gallbladder cancer. So we thought that it is a small price to be paid for uh, you know, uh, preventing that. So that is why we still go ahead and do it. And because we have had patients, because you know one of the other things, maybe because it's not an endemic zone in that region, they have tried to say that 
most of the i mean you would agree that in your experience also not all of them are part of the metastatic peritoneal disease because we have a patients who have come after 2 years 3 years or even more so those are the ones because by definition also port site recurrence is when there is no disease elsewhere and it is only in the port and having said that again port actually means scar because it has we have seen similar recurrence even in the scar recurrence after open incidental valvular cancer what are you views about neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh that's a matter of big debate and i think you know uh, even though now the better chemotherapeutic drugs are working but in my presentation i used to have a slide in which i used to show that see the tumor has shrunk however the same size tumor was resectable so we don't want to wait if it was resectable to begin with and in fact uh, tata i think they they the uh, shailesh and uh, mahesh a lot of time we had this discussion you would also recall that on the sidelines of ihpb we had that discussion with neo adjuvant we should do a trial but you know the issue in that comes is that because the philosophy of ivra center is a bit different so how far do you go and what you define as a borderline resectable is different for gallbladder cancer as compared to a pancreatic cancer which is better defined so in this regard we think that a tumor which is resectable in a patient which is otherwise reasonably fit to undergo that procedure we would not wait for a new adjuvant only in some of the borderline or you had some other risk factors or we wanted to give a test of time if there was a ifi lesion then maybe you can start new adjuvant reassess those patients so i mean those are my thoughts i wouldn't say that it is but, but i think in the lit literature also it's not very clear that these are the patients in which you must give a new adjuvant uh, one of the delegates wants to know whether there are any reports on immunotherapy in gallbladder cancer uh, uh, just uh, i mean there are some reports but i think it has not yet come the clinical surface to say that you can use those as a this thing but dr vinay maybe you can also add on to because you have a extensive experience about this and what is your personal thoughts about new adjuvant i i uh, we don't have any prospective uh, evaluation so i don't think i can give any data but i tend to use it as you mentioned uh, in some patients who have uh, fairly uh, advanced loco regional disease to uh, see the biological behavior so uh, these are the patients in whom we will give new adjuvant treatment and see Uh, whether they respond or that the disease uh, worsens because if the disease worsens or does not respond these are patients who probably would not benefit from even an extensive resection uh what about pre operative biliary drainage when a patient has jaundice and you want to go ahead with surgery what are your indications and how long do you wait see our our indication in that regard is that if it is a level of the we will be based on level of jaundice and how long the duration has been so it's a short lasting with less than 10 less than 10 we would go ahead and operate and also it will depend on whether you know the confluence is patent or not and we are planning a segment 4b5 or an extended resection but having said that beyond 10 we would drain all of them or prolonged period of jaundice we would drain all of them because you have to be ready in terms of that any of these patients may need an extensive resection may need a vascular resection or reconstruction so even if you can get away with segment 4b5 but most of the time you have to be prepared for that so i think I, I, maybe it's a little bit of a uh, you know i'm not so uh, kind of clear in the sense that we always have this debate that what is the duration whether two weeks four weeks or beyond so what i would think is that if there's a jaundice which is beyond a month then even if it is less than 10 we would go ahead and drain that of course this will be taken into account together with that there have been any cholangitis episodes what is the age of the patient what is the you know fitness of the patient like some of the things which you would you know titrate according to that. is there a place for central hepatectomy in some patients with gallbladder cancer uh we had one patient recently in which we thought that we might have to do a 
central epitectomy, but more often than not, it is not the case because uh, the involvement is such because when it is the, you know, the fundus or the body tumor, it tends to go in those areas which you can get resected with a segment 4B5, sometimes with 4B5 and 6. Whereas the ones which are in the neck region, it is very, very, very occasional or rare that you would be able to save the sectoral this thing. One patient was there in which we were trying to assess, but then we realized that that was more because the left lateral was not good enough. And we were thinking whether we do a portal vein embolization and things like that, because otherwise, oncologically, it may not be a good idea to you know, do a median hepatectomy in something which is neck tumor. How would you select a case for HPD? Uh, I mean, that's a very good, interesting thing because which I've recently written in one of the things that HPD, I would say that even though it is loosely applied as a hepatopancreatic duodenectomy to all cases, but at one end of the spectrum is somebody in a non-cholestatic needing a segment 4B5 with a pancreatic duodenectomy. There would be no problems because I think the morbidity of that patient is going to be similar to a pancreatic duodenectomy. However, on the other extreme, which we would be skeptical and would very, very rarely do that, even after uh, you know drainage, is somebody who is a cholestatic liver after drainage needing an extended right hepatectomy with a PD. So that we would only do it in a relatively younger, fitter patient. So that would be, and the others will come in between. And, and the, having said that again, as you saw that what we have been more often talking about is to, as far as possible, if we can get away with doing a gastroduodenal resection and uh, wedge pancreatic resection. Incidental gallbladder cancer, where we know that during the index cholecystectomy, there was bile spill because of GB perforation, what would be your approach? See, even if we knew, because I think there is data and the literature talks about that those have a higher chance of recurrence. But still, they are better off if you didn't resect them. So we would go ahead for resecting them, even if there was a bile leak. And probably those, depending on several other factors, they may be candidate for adjuvant treatment. So that is what would be the thing. Because even if you look at it, uh, I mean, what we don't know from our data, because some of the incidental gallbladder cancer, which we may have operated in the past, may actually have had by leak, which was not reported because I think most of our cholecystectomy discharge slips do not talk about by leak. And I think uh, at one point people used to talk about that between five to 20%, depending on the center, depending on the experience, there may be some amount of by leak. And, the, uh, and, the, uh, and another thing is that some of the incidental gallbladder cancer patients that we have operated, even if there was no mention of bile leak, when we go in, we find spilled uh, stones or some other telltale evidence to suggest that there was bile leak. So I think as, the, as of now, what the literature tells us is that that should not be taken as a contraindication for going ahead for completion radical polycystectomy and possibly you should assess for adjuvant treatment. At the time of re-operation for incidental gallbladder cancer, do you always try to do a cystic duct frozen section, excision and frozen section? Honestly, not. Do you? We uh, try. But, look but for the stump. If it is reasonably long without jeopardizing the CBD, we can do it. Yes, we would do it. Yeah, we would do. I mean, as you said that you will do it in all cases. That's what I'm saying. Because some of the cases, and especially if the earlier cholecystectomy time, the cystic duct was small, it is kind of plastered together with the CBD, we wouldn't want to dissect in that area. And of course, in that regard, it would have been helpful if we had the pre-operative or the, I mean, not pre-second -op pre operation, the histopathology, which suggested where the tumor was. So I think we would expect that if it was near the neck or the cystic duct, it would probably be reported in histopathology. So I think, we are not always, not in all cases, we, we have, we would, I mean, I would put it this way that no, we would not do that extra effort mm -hmm. in all cases to try and fish it out from when that clip, etc. is totally plastered with the bile duct. Even B, your policy is to re-operate. Yeah, yes. 
but would you give adjuvant treatment also after reoperation to these patients? T one B we would not unless lymph nodes were positive. If the lymph nodes were positive, it was T one B N zero. Then, as per the literature, I mean, you may not, you will probably not need to give it. But I think sometimes the oncologist may have, you know, because once they go to the oncologist. But as a, from our side, we would not recommend for them. What about you? Would you recommend T1B? No. 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 Uh, there is a question from one Dr. Caleb Harris. I, I presume I am interpreting it right. He says that if frozen section is not available and you have a GB mass, what would you do? You would resect or you would do intraop FNAC. So I suppose he's saying that we have done uh, operation and we find that it is not stone disease. It looks like possible malignancy. So what would you do? So I, I would gather what he's saying is that he has removed the gallbladder, opened the gallbladder and examined and sees that there is probably a mass lesion. Now there are two things. One is that if frozen is not available, you can do an imprint cytology because that also has been pretty helpful. And in fact, there are correlation to the extent of even 80% in some of the papers. That depends again on your pathologist. However, having said that, I would presume that because you've removed the gallbladder, so it is limited disease. So even if it was not confirmed by frozen section, you could still go ahead and do a radical cholecystectomy. And rather than waiting and subsequently a pathology report coming out, because even though the MSKC's experience, some of the other centers have talked about that a redo surgery has not been such a negative factor, but why lose that chance of going right away when you have inspected? Because this is a case that you are talking about that you opened the gallbladder and it appears suspicious. Would you agree with that, Dr. Vinay? Yes, yes. Only thing is that what we have described that in these cases, we would uh, uh, take out the gallbladder with a small wedge of liver so that you don't breach the oncological plane. And uh, if frozen is not available, best is to request your pathologist for an early report so that if it is positive, you can go in in the same admission. Yeah, but I think because I uh, the, the, the way the question was that Probably he's already removed the gallbladder and opened and seen that there is a mass lesion. So, uh, there are some more questions coming in. Dr. Beju, can we go ahead or? And I can see a lot of friends there. So, uh, um, there is no time limit. If you are okay, uh, you can proceed with the uh, questions. Uh, but uh, if it is not okay with you, you can join the WhatsApp group, which is there in the uh, a C of uh, SPB1 uh, and uh, and uh, can have the discussion there also after this one. I am fine with that, Dr. Vinay. Are you okay with continuing with the questions? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm okay. You are the... <laughs> okay. okay. Fine. So, uh, uh, somebody wants to know what is the strategy for missed gallbladder cancer? I am not sure because it's not a standard term. So uh, I presume it is that we have done cholecystectomy and then there is a recurrence. Is that, uh, uh, Dr. Sujan Shresh, can you please unmute yourself and clarify what exactly you mean by missed gallbladder cancer? Dr. Sujan Shresh. I think he said yes. So that it means that probably what you have interpreted. Yes. So I would, uh, Sujan, do you have anything to say? But I would say that maybe you are talking about two situations. One is that uh, missed when you are saying so, which means that, I mean, in this, are you saying that the person comes back only with recurrence, what Dr. Vinay talked about, that because the gallbladder probably was not sent for histopathology and subsequently they come with recurrence. And this is what we had published one of the uh, papers in which we said that all removed gallbladders must be sent for histopathology. Because the UK, there was one paper which talked about that probably only in suspected cases, you go ahead and send it for pathology. Don't uh, burden your pathologist with these gallbladders. But I think as when we analyzed our experience, we realized that those patients which were coming with a biopsy report were coming at a reasonable time and we could go ahead and do a completion radical cholecystectomy with pretty good results. Whereas those which were landing up first time with a recurrence, some of them even with jaundice. Those are the ones which had more advanced disease. The resectability was much lower, far lower. In fact, maybe it was one is to four or one is to five. And 
those which were resectable needed more extensive resection as compared to somebody who came with a histopathology report of gallbladder cancer. So I think that is one thing. Second thing is probably as Dr. Vinay is quite fond of using this terminology and missed is something that probably should have been suspected on prior imaging, either on ultrasound or CT. And when we analyzed our data, we realized that probably 50% of what was labeled as incidental gallbladder cancer was not really incidental and it was a pseudo incidental, I would say, because by definition, incidental is when you didn't suspect pre-op, per-op, after removing the gallbladder, and when you send that to the pathologist, it only comes as a histological surprise. Whereas these patients, the very fact that you thought that there was a thickening and you ordered a CT scan, probably left that it was somewhat of an interpretational error that what was malignancy was viewed as a benign disease. So when we analyzed our experience, we realized about 50% of these patients were pseudo. And in fact, even if you look at the world literature, what papers are published as incidental gallbladder cancer tends to mislead because by definition, most or almost all of incidental gallbladder cancer, which are histological surprise, would be T1 or T2. It shouldn't be beyond that because something which is going into the distant viscera or there was a big mass lesion, exceptions accepted, of course, in which probably you thought that the uh, adhesions were inflammatory rather than uh, malignant involvement of the structure. And because it may sometimes superimpose with the xanthogranulomatous cholecystitis. But having said that, most of the incidental gallbladder cancer uh, so reported in the literature are actually post-operative diagnosis of a gallbladder cancer rather than truly incidental gallbladder cancer. Yeah, there are two more questions about, again, the same thing that if there was a bile spill, I think Dr. Anil has clarified that although it carries a poorer prognosis, but that is not a contraindication for doing a re-operation for completion extended cholecystectomy. I would just read out a, a comment by Dr. Bhushan Bhalgat from Jaipur that we should try to develop a predictive model to know that uh, what would be the outcome of an individual patient after an, uh, a particular procedure because this model has been worked out in other cancers. Yes, very good suggestion. I think if we have a database which tells what was the stage of the disease and what was the outcome, uh, some statistical uh, method can be used for uh, uh, doing this analysis. So I think with that, uh, I would like to hand it over back to Dr. Beju. And uh, with his permission, I've already put in the chat box an announcement that any of the delegates, if they want to receive a soft copy complimentary of my next unpublished book on operative surgery, uh, please send me a mail, vkkapoor.india at gmail.com. Just write pearls in operative surgery in the subject of the mail. In the next one week, I should be able to send you a copy. Thank you very much. I, Thank uh, you. Dr. Dr. Abdullah has probably written that if so, if no available frozen section, so completion. Yes. The answer to that is yes, that you can go ahead and do a completion radical cholecystectomy, even if the frozen or a uh, imprint cytology is not available and i think uh, probably the important is to have an informed consent from the you know if the patient is under an anesthesia and you have not talked to them about this possibility prior then you should need uh, permission from the relatives thank you dr anil thank you very much thank you very much thank you dr uh, anil lagarwal and uh, vk kapoor sir for uh, the wonderful interaction Actually, we all enjoyed the interaction. I, actually, I did intervene in between because uh, we were enjoying it uh, thoroughly. And there are a lot of other questions also. Almost 20 questions are there. I request both of you to join a WhatsApp group, which is a temporary WhatsApp group for this uh, uh, CAGV alone. for radical You have those questions, Dr. Beju. You can read out some of those. We can talk about them now if because that will benefit all of them. Do you have those questions in front of you? Because yeah, it, it is in the chat box only. Uh, uh, I mean, with the level of bilirubin that you're still going for resection, I think partly we had answered. But the other thing is that, you know, usually as we talk about in Whipple's or in uh, this thing, uh, gallbladder cancer, you would want to, to normalize and wait for some more time for the microsomal function to come back. However, because it's a malignancy, so you don't want to wait that long. 
So I think what our practice has been that if, if, if it comes below five, we start planning and maybe below three, we would take up those patients for surgery. And that would be the thing. And the only other thing is that if you wanted to do a portal vein embolization, you should not do when the bilirubin is high. And so you have to get the bilirubin low, less than five at least, before you can do a portal vein embolization. And uh, intraoperative ultrasound. Intraoperative ultrasound, we have not been using. We used it uh, some time ago, uh, that uh, intraoperative ultrasound. But in laparoscopy, we don't have the laparoscopic ultrasound. So we have not been using that. But in open earlier, we used to do some resections. So that is also now not a common thing. And the thing is with the imaging getting better, there are very few reports now in the literature in which they talk about other distant metastases, unlike what you talk about colorectal liver metastases or other situations. I don't know, Dr. Vinay, what is your view on that? Because intraoperative ultrasound not is, a, is not a standard practice for detecting other lesions. And it is not a very good indicator for vascular involvement in the local region. And it may be helpful more as a guide for surgery in terms of the resection of various segments. Uh, 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 radical cholecystectomy with the hepatectomy, what uh, is the margin if the frozen section is not available? No, radical cholecystectomy, we don't always get a frozen because it's a bile duct on which we may get a margin done. Because liver, when you are taking segment 4B5 and it is more extensive than you do an extended right hepatectomy, which may be modified extended hepatectomy. So that is not so much of an issue. Sometimes what has happened, we have discussed with our pathologist also, is that near the neck, and if it, you know, it's a preserved liver, sometimes it may tear and it may appear that it is reaching up to the surface, but it is well circumscribed. And usually that has not been so much of a problem in terms of management but we don't usually get a frozen section done because then you would need it from the entire liver and that would be a massive exercise. And it is not so common to have, even when the liver infiltration is there, a creeping sub, I mean, as we say that what we are talking about microscopic disease, creeping towards the surface is not so much. So that is not our practice. Uh, Dr. Vinay, do you get a liver margin as a frozen? No, it's not required. It's not required. Only when there is some doubt in some given case for neck tumors or something, you may, otherwise it's not required. I think uh, we can uh, stop here. Uh, there'll be uh, a lot more questions also. Anyway, we all enjoyed the thorough interaction between uh, you two people. And uh, mm, uh, the next meeting is supposed to be on 27th, uh, a cold doctor assist by uh, none other than Sadi Sikora and it will be moderated by uh, Dr. T.D. Yadav. I take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, Dr. Anil Agarwal was taken this time. Actually, he was attending another meeting, um, SPB meeting. Uh, and uh, Professor Vika Kapoor sir also for, for uh, joining this meeting to moderate this uh, session. And I thank uh, uh, the uh, young surgeons, Dr. Hari Kovind and uh, uh, Dr. Abhishek Dajit for introducing the moderator and, uh, and uh, the speaker. And I thank all the, all the participants who are logging from different countries. Uh, we had actually uh, four 13 uh, participants uh, that were the maximum uh, limit. And uh, uh, we all enjoyed the sessions and uh, the talk was wonderful. Uh, I thank all of you uh, for uh, this wonderful uh, evening. Thank you, Dr. Beju. It was really a pleasure and thank you for the invitation. And uh, 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 thank you, Hari. And of course, thank you, Dr. Vinay Kapoor. It's always a pleasure to, you know, have a discussion with you on gallbladder cancer, which is so close to your heart. And so am I passionate about gallbladder cancer. And I think uh, it was lovely to be a part of your uh, foundation, Dr. Beju. And I must also put on record that, you know, a lot of our earlier faculty and also the residents who have con contributed so much. And I think we have been able to do a lot of these things and especially so in the laparoscopic, thanks to our young colleagues, the faculty, as well as the residents who kept us pushing. And so thank you very much. And thank you, Baju and Dr. Vinay.
once again thank you thank you thank you all thank you all good night